Now, uh, as Tony said, onwards to our next session, where we're going to have a short uh, speech by Clemence Cotez, uh, the head of the Economic Department Secret of the CNIL, the uh, French uh, DPA, and to introduce Clemence, we welcome Benoit Oberle from the IAB France uh, newly elected board, uh, and Benoit is also newly elected as its treasurer. So Benoit, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Constantin. Um, since 2018, many DPA issued guidance for digital advertising under the GDPR, and there seems to be an alignment on a few core issues. That's why we think that we need to better understand how DPA's interpretations of e-privacy and the GDPR are converging, specifically on cross-border enforcement. And I'm pleased to introduce Clemence Cotez, head of the Economic Sector Department of the CNIL, one of the most active DPA in Europe, who accepted to share her comprehension with us. Clemence, uh, would you please help us to better understand the interactions between the e-privacy directive and the GDPR? Yes, thank you very much, Benoit. Uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to explain how the privacy directive and the GDPR interact, because I think this is the first phase to, phase to better understand how DPAs are acting regarding cross-border enforcement and how the, these two tools, e-privacy and the GDPR, can articulate on specific data processing and at least how we can, between DPAs, reach a common ground regarding the rules applying to direct marketing. So uh, next slide, please. I will start with uh, an explanation regarding the possible overlap you can have between the, the GDPR and uh, e-privacy. Uh, there is an overlap, but there, this is, does not necessarily lead to a conflict between the rules. Uh, as you can see, the GDPR itself explicitly refers to processing activities, which also trigger, at least in part, the material scope of the e-privacy directive. Uh, I mean, uh, Restal uh, 30 of the GDPR elab elaborates on the definition of online identifiers. Uh, it uh, refers to uh, cookie identifiers and other, other identifiers that can leave traces and may be used to create profiles of the natural person. So in this case, clearly, we have the uh, data processing implying the uh, application of the GDPR and e-privacy. And finally, the CGU has confirmed that it is possible for processing to fall within the material scope of both the e-privacy directive and the GDPR. Uh, in the in its decision um, about we we shaft academy uh, fashion id and so on so this is nothing new but i think this is important to recall that these two tools can apply simultaneously and can be applied differently uh, depending on the member state that is uh, concerned and next slide please thank you so I, I must re um, remind you what is the intent of the privacy rules, because one will ask why is there a specific legislation applying to electronic communication when the GDPR is already applicable to the processing performed on electronic communications. Uh, the spirit of the e-privacy direct directive is complementary but different from the GDPR. It aims at uh, uh, ensuring the respect for private life, confidentiality of communications, uh, and not data protection in itself. Uh, this is part of Article 7 of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, and uh, this is something we can apply to our daily life. Uh, it's about private life and confidentiality as a whole. Uh, uh, at the same time, the, the GDPR offer a set of rules, a more general set of rules to um, apprehend any data processing and reach uh, a high level of protection of personal data. So you have a, a, a general regulation, which is the GDPR, that would apply on any data processing, and then a specific regulation, the e-privacy directive, that will specify in some cases that might be more might be more sensitive uh, when and how the consent sh sh should intervene. So, um, can you put the next slide, please? I, I will give you a, a concrete example. Yes. 
This is an example we will find in the in guidelines that were released by our, um, uh, our colleague, I think it's no way, uh, about programmatic buying of users on ad exchanges. And I have uh, tried to put uh, some indications to where, uh, about where and when e-privacy and the GDPR would be uh, uh, applicable. Um, you you have the first uh, the first moment when Carl uh, is identified uh, as having two children, uh, being forty one years uh, forty one years old and so on. This is a profile. This profile has been built might have been built by the data broker uh, that have um, collected information uh, through the internet browsing of individuals uh, by uh, the use of cookies and that may have includes personal data obtained via others, various other sources, I mean uh, commercial partners. In this case, you will have the e-privacy e directive that would be applicable to the reading uh, and placing of cookies on the, the device of Carl, and you will have the GDPR that, that would apply to the data processing that occurs after this operation. Uh, you see that this apply also at the stage of the, the ad exchange uh, and sell site platform and and so on. So at all these stages, at finally the data protection authorities and uh, national regulatory authorities can apply either the privacy directive or the GDPR because there are, there is always a data processing following the operation of uh, uh, accessing or storing information on. Uh, a device. Can you put the next slide, please? So, in this respect, what are the DPA competences? Uh, regarding the e-privacy, this is more difficult than for the, the GDPR, because the GDPR is pretty clear about the data protection authority's competences, and it's not the case in the e-privacy directive. So, the e-privacy directive has to be translated in each member states, and each member state can, uh, through national laws, give con competences to, to data protection authorities to enforce the provi provisions of the e-privacy directive. And it's not always the case, because some, sometimes you can have um, authorities that are linked to uh, telecommunications that are in charge of, uh, of this part of the regulation or consumer protection of the organization or ministry and so on. I will give you uh, after that uh, an example of uh, uh, the example of Finland, which is quite, quite different from France and to see how this uh, difference between uh, this, the facts that two authorities can intervene on the same data processing sometimes leads to discrepancies inside a member state. So please, next slide. So what you show, remind, recall, is that uh, DPAs uh, assess the lawfulness of all other processing operations that follow the storing or access to information in the, term, in the um, device of the, the, the end user. Uh, because Article 5.3 does not contain special rules uh, for any prior or subsequent processing activities. This is just about the operation. This is not about the processing that will follow or, or prior to the, the, the storing or access to information uh, in the in the device, so data protection of, uh, authorities remain fully competent and can activate the co cooperation and consistency mechanism to uh, any data processing that following uh, this operation that is subject to Article 5.3 of the e-privacy directive. And uh, when an authority like the CNIL, like uh, like the French DPA, has both. Uh, competences, I mean the competence for the GDPR and the competence for uh, the, the enforcement of the privacy directive, this authority can choose between uh, the, those two uh, set of rules to see what is the, the, the more valuable, the, the more valid uh, interpretation and analysis and apply either this set of rules or, or other. And I will give you an example right now with the next slide. So you have the case of France. France is 
competent for both uh, regulations. And in this case, in France, our national law, which is uh, the Data Protection Act, uh, says that uh, the CNIL can enforce the privacy directives when it is carried out within the framework of the activities of an establishment of a data controller or processor on French territory, whether or not the processing takes place in France. This is basically the analysis that had uh, been retained by the, the CGU in the Costeja uh, decision, uh, meaning that if you have an establishment, even if it's not a main establishment in France, that take part, even uh, access, uh, um, uh, not, in, even not entirely in the data processing following the, the operation consisting in placing uh, cookies on the device. In this case, you can be uh, the the, the, the e-privacy directive can be enforced by the CNIL, uh, even if you have a main establishment uh, with regard to the GDPR in, for example, in Germany. Uh, um, this is not the case in Finland. In Finland, the Finnish Transport and Communication Agency is competent to enforce e-privacy, the e-privacy e directive, and. On the other side, the uh, Finnish Data Protection Authority is competent to enforce the GDPR for what concerns the, the processings um, following the operation subject to e-privacy, the e-privacy directive. So we had, I have an example of a discrepancy uh, inside uh, one member state. This is the Finnish case. Uh, during um, over the last uh, two months, uh, we had a decision from the Data Protection uh, Authority of this member state saying that uh, uh, consent must be uh, tr translated in an affirmative action uh, and that follows all the, the recommendations of the the EDPB guidelines. And on the other side, we had another uh, decision from the Traficom, which is a Finnish transport and communication agency, saying that uh, the continuous browsing uh, on, on a website can be uh, considered as the expression of a consent. In any case, uh, the data protection authorities has, uh, have the power to, to, uh, to enforce the, the um, interpretation, their interpretation of the GDPR, and this interpretation is um, directly linked to the definition of the consent in the e-privacy directive. So, in this uh, in this sense, we we have the last uh, the, the last word in this regard, uh, meaning that we have to interpret whether or not the consent, even if there is a consent, and the, that. Uh, from the data control of the website point of view, there is a consent. At least we, we will have to interpret it regarding the guidelines, the common guidelines of the EDPB. So next slide, please. So the main question was well, is uh, what about cross-border enforcement? Uh, you may have seen that uh, each member state or many member states and DPAs uh, intervened on the area of, um, of uh, direct marketing and specifically uh, um, cookies and uh, things that are also uh, uh, subject to the e-privacy directive. But on uh, for the most part of it, this is uh, there are um, local cases, just local cases in uh, for which each DPA uh, enforced the GDPR and their interpretation of the GDPR which is convergent which the, with the interpretation of the GDPR that has been translated last month in the new version of the guidelines regarding consent. So what's going on? We have ongoing procedures regarding the enforcement of the GDPR uh, and this uh, ongoing enforcement can be local. So at this stage, we do not have a, a cooperation or um, a cooperation between GPAs because it's not mandatory. And on the other side, we have a, a more important ongoing procedures uh, regarding cross-border process, processings uh, analyzed regarding, with regard to the GDPR. And we might have some big decisions by the end of the year, but we're still waiting for them. And we have an section regarding uh, Spain and, and the French GPA because uh, the Spanish DPA is 
competent for the application of the e-privacy directive, just as uh, the French EPA is. Uh, and uh, you all are aware of the different interpretation the, Sp uh, the Spanish EPA has about the expression of uh, consent. Uh, on this matter, the EGPB uh, has intervened uh, last month to uh, clarify the guidelines regarding consent to make sure that uh, the, the continuous browsing, the scrolling on a website cannot be considered as a valid consent. So there was a, a decision uh, by the, the Spanish DPA and this decision was analyzed and has uh, been discussed and uh, we have reached a consensus that is uh, uh, stated in the new versions of the guidelines. So please, uh, next slide, I will uh, tackle the, the, the difficult issue of uh, the, the interpretation and the conversions between the interpretations of each member state and DPAs. Uh, and I have, uh, I have um, made uh, some, how can I say, uh, it's not um, sorry. I have tried to to, um, to to take every decision and to uh, to check whether or not we are uh, converging to a common interpretation about the positive action, the notion of specific consent, uh, the need to have an easy way to say no or to withdraw the consent, and the prohibition of cookie walls. And the good news is that uh, at least uh, for uh, for the next, the, during the last year, uh, almost every DPA had the same interpretation, not in the same world, but the same interpretation. For example, the need for positive action, uh, meaning the exclusion of the browsing or references to the browser settings, uh, was affirmed, confirmed by uh, Belgium, Denmark, UK, Netherlands, uh, Finland, um, Greece, uh, Ireland, France, uh, the same for the need for a specific consent, meaning that we need a granularity of the purposes that are presented to the user when he is asked for his, his or her consent. Uh, the need to have an easy way to say no or to withdraw the consent, and that's the, the big news. Uh, we have uh, Greece, Ireland, Belgium, Denmark, UK, and Netherlands, and Finland and France that have uh, reached a common a consensus on this uh, this aspect, and finally the prohibition of cookie wall. Uh, and in this respect, uh, we are fully aware of the decision of Austria uh, in November 2018 uh, regarding the acceptance of cookie walls. Uh, and when uh, this authority said that users are still free to consult other newspaper if they are not happy with the cookie wall. Uh, this decision is an old decision. It, uh, it's from two years ago. Uh, and this decision uh, was taken into account also in the revision of the guidelines regarding consent uh, to confirm that uh, cookie walls are not acceptable. And on this respect, uh, uh, I think there is something we can underline. Uh, Ireland has released uh, guidance in April, April uh, confirming this interpretation. This is the case also for UK. Uh, uh, the ICO uh, has confirmed this interpretation in a decision regarding the Washington Post and so on. So, I, I, please, can you put the next slide? I think that uh, as a conclusion, uh, we have we are reaching uh, progressively a consensus on, on what uh, is a, a valid con a consent valid and uh, on privacy standards regarding the GDPR and e privacy and uh, actually those two set of rules can work together and be articulated to uh, to to ensure that there is the same uh, interpretation regarding the processing and the action of tracking. So uh, we will uh, wait for the, the, the future procedure and decisions uh, at the European level. I think we, you all uh, should be, how can I say, um, uh, provide some attention to, to this decision and uh, at this, uh, the level of the CNIL, we are going to uh, present our recommendation.
uh, regarding cookies uh, at the end of September, at least, or the beginning of October. So I think this is the time to say that there are still great opportunities to de develop better tools and to map and simplify the attack data flows and, and above all, uh, uh, improve transparency and consent mechanism. So thank you for, uh, and thanks to the IAB to, to have to do have given the opportunity to, to speak of that.